Pokemon Colosseum is an interesting game to say the least. It stands out among the rest of the series in several ways. There are no gyms or champion, all battles are double battles, you can only save at PCs, it has an edgy aesthetic, and it has shadow Pokemon. Shadow Pokemon are the product of the game's evil organization, Cypher, taking a corrupting Pokemon to make them stronger. These Pokemon are distributed among Cypher's members and many other NPCs throughout the game. The player is tasked with stealing, I mean snagging, Shadow Pokemon with a special snag machine. Once caught, these Shadow Pokemon can be purified, returning them back to normal. Until a Shadow Pokemon is purified, it won't be able to level up, evolve, or learn any additional moves, so they're typically not great in battle until purified. In total, there are 48 Shadow Pokemon, most of which are from the Johto region with a few from Hoenn mixed in. And despite all the added mechanics, these Shadow Pokemon can be shiny, but it's complicated. Normally, shinies are pretty noticeable. They're a different color for one, and they have a sparkle animation that plays when encountered. But Colosseum is different because you can't tell if a Pokemon is shiny until after you catch it. Let me explain. At the start of a Pokemon game, the player is assigned a trainer ID number, which is visible on your trainer card, and a secret ID number, which is hidden. The game takes your trainer ID and secret ID values and compares them to each Pokemon's personality value, or PID, to determine if that Pokemon will be shiny. Now, in Colosseum, all Shadow Pokemon are sent into battle by another trainer. The opposing trainer also gets their own TID and SID. And the first time you battle them, that trainer's Pokemon will never appear shiny. So let's say this is your trainer ID, secret ID combo, and you fight a trainer whose Shadow Pokemon should be shiny based on these. But when sent out by the opponent, the Pokemon appears normal. However, immediately after you catch it, the Shadow Pokemon will now reference your TID and SID and magically transform in your party. It's clear that this is not how the developers intended for this to work, and in their follow-up XD Gale of Darkness, all Shadow Pokemon are shiny locked even after the player catches them. Aside from the strange way shinies appear, hunting them should be pretty similar to other games in the third generation. The odds of finding one is 1 in 8192, with no way to boost the odds, and because you have to battle and catch the Pokemon each time to check if it's shiny, each encounter will probably take a while. With the added time and hoops to jump through, why would anyone hunt in this game? Well, Shadow Pokemon have some attributes that make them stand out among the rest. When purified, they automatically obtain the National Ribbon, which is exclusive to Shadows and grants the title The Triumphant in Sword and Shield and Scarlet and Violet when transferred up. Pokemon from these games also have a met location of a distant land, which is cool because almost all other Pokemon caught in the main series will have a region name, such as Kanto, Sinnoh, or Gala region. While these are admittedly minor aesthetic details, shininess is also purely aesthetic. So if we care about what color a Pokemon is, these are other things to consider. Now let's talk about why we're here. I want to catch all the shadow Pokemon in Colosseum in one playthrough, and I want to catch them all shiny. Sounds like a tall order, right? But wait, there's more! In Sword and Shield, a new shiny animation was added for certain Pokemon that changes the usual stars to squares. The type of animation is determined by much of the same info that goes into shininess, and without getting too technical, each shiny has a 1 in 16 chance of having square sparkles when transferred to Galar. So far, this mechanic hasn't been seen in any other game, but the information is saved with the Pokemon. So square shinies maintain their square gene, if you will, whether the game supports that feature or not. Even all the way back in Gen 3, Pokemon have this square shiny gene, essentially making them extra rare shinies in this case. What are the odds of finding a square shiny in Colosseum? 1 in 131,072. Yeah, it's pretty rare. Assuming you even have a way of checking which shiny type you found, that entails full odds hunting around 15 shinies of each Pokemon, only to reset over all of them because they don't have the right animation. Assuming each encounter takes 2 minutes, which is very generous by the way, it would take close to 24 years of straight hunting just to hit full odds for all 48 Pokemon. Now I know what you're thinking, surely this is an impossible task. Hell, the US version of the game was released in 2004, only 19 years ago. Even if I had started this challenge on release day, I still wouldn't be done by now. But thankfully, we have technology. Or should I say RNG manipulation. RNG, or Random Number Generator, refers to the mechanism that most Pokemon games and many other games use to create what feels like randomness to the player. These pseudo-random number generators are algorithms that take an initial seed value 
and create a string of outputs that appear random but are actually very predictable. If one can deduce the initial seed for the algorithm, one can predict the following outcomes. For Colosseum, the initial seed is determined by the system's date and time and can't be manipulated reliably on retail hardware. Despite this, there are several ways to determine your seed simply by playing the game and referencing external tools. Using these tools, we can now feasibly catch all square shiny shadows in months rather than years. If you're new to RNG, you might be wondering, is this a legitimate way to play the game? Am I cheating by using these tools? Well, I would argue that RNGing is not only completely legitimate, but is actually more fun than hunting without it. Let's break it down. First, concerning legitimacy. I'm playing the game completely unmodified on retail hardware. There is nothing special about my copy of the game. Anyone with the ability to run the game can do what I'm doing. Second, all the tools that I use are in no way interfaced with my game console or reading information that can't be seen outside of normal gameplay. Think of these RNG tools as special calculators. I record feedback from the game, input that info into my program, and the program tells me what I need to do next to hit my target. It's very similar to referencing an online strategy guide. Finally, Pokemon caught using RNG are identical to those caught without it. Using these methods does not alter the Pokemon caught, it simply shows me how to get the one I'm looking for. Now concerning the experience aspect, RNG manipulation takes a lot of skill and knowledge of the game beyond that of a casual player. This makes hunting much more engaging because everything you do is intentional. You have to be mindful of a lot of mechanics that you wouldn't think about otherwise, your button inputs need to be very precise and timed well, and by the end of a successful RNG, you now have a deeper understanding of the game and the Pokemon you want. Compare that to the end result of soft resetting. You might come away with the shiny you wanted, but that's all you have to show for your time and effort. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against soft resetting or full odds hunting. I do it myself all the time, but only when RNG manipulation is not feasible. When given the option, it's an obvious choice for me. Alright, now that we've covered all the bases, let's get started. For reasons I'll get into later, I use the European version of Colosseum. Since I'm from the US, I had to order a PAL Wii with GameCube ports to get it running. On screen is a list of all the programs and tools I used throughout. I also have them listed in the description of the video. Some of these programs have an English interface, and some are written in Japanese. I don't know any Japanese, but I already have some experience using these tools, and have basically memorized how they work regardless. Also, while I'll demonstrate broadly how I use these programs, this video is not meant to be an in-depth tutorial. To get a better grasp, I suggest checking out I'm Ablissi's Coliseum playlist and joining their Discord server. I've also included several guides in the description to fill in any gaps. As a final note on these, while most of the tools are pretty accessible, newer releases of CoTool are not, as the creator decided to restrict access to them. With all of that out of the way, let's finally begin. We start our journey with a quick ID SID RNG manip. Without doing this, I can't find out my secret ID, which is what my programs need to tell which Pokemon are shiny. First, we cycle through the Battle Now teams in the main menu to figure out our initial seed using the GameCube Seed Finder in PokeFinder. Remember, our initial seed is not controllable and essentially random. We will be doing this a lot, basically every time we do anything. Once we have our seed, we plug that into the ID tab in CoTool. Any version will work for this manip. Now for my run of all square shinies, I want to have a cool ID number to go with them. So I settled on five zeros with the trainer name Cypher after the evil team. The idea being that these shadow Pokemon were kidnapped by Cypher and in the process of becoming shadow, they lost their identities and are forever marked by their captors. Coliseum graphic novel coming soon. Anyway, I type in my desired ID in the box and search for results near my seed. If nothing pops up, simply reset and repeat. Once we get a result, take a look at the number next to your seed. This tells us how many frames it will take to hit our desired ID after starting a new game. We want this number to be the same or similar for every attempt to make calibration consistent. The easiest way to bring this number down is to continuously go in and out of the Battle Now menu and recheck your seed. Each time you do this, the game consumes about a thousand frames. After reaching a number in your desired range, plug it into a frame to millisecond converter. I use the one on blissy.net. For me to get through the name screen in time, I needed at least 15 seconds per attempt and hovered in the 1100 to 1900 range when possible. After watching the cutscene, open the menu and check which ID you hit. If it's not the one you want, 
plug it back into Kotool and see how off you were for your offset. For the first RNG of the run, it's not too bad, but it did take me more than a few attempts to get right. After finally getting the five zeros, we take control of the protagonist and head towards the abandoned train. We are interrupted by two shady characters that definitely don't have a body in the back of their hover car. We then enter and see a news report of our most recent exploit at the Team Snagum hideout. There are actually two evil teams in this game, Team Snagum and Cypher, but there's very little difference between them and they do essentially the same thing. After leaving, we're stopped by Willy, who challenges us to our first battle of the game. Willy is special, not only because he thinks he can take us on with two Zigzagoons, but also because he has one of the only normal names in the game. Pay attention and you'll see. After crushing him, we head to Finnax City, where we run into those two thugs who are definitely not carrying a body. After defeating them, we meet our companion for the remainder of the game, Rui. Her only role is to identify shadow Pokémon with her clairvoyance or something. I like how they straight up replaced her with a device in XD so we didn't have someone following us around all the time. Regardless, she's not too much of a bother, mostly. With Rui in tow, we go to visit the mayor of the city. I'm stopped by this guy who looks pretty sick, not gonna lie, before entering and having a chat with the mayor, Escade. Escade? Eh, whatever. He's a cute little man that definitely has nothing to hide. After he gaslights the hell out of Rui, we head to the city's battle stadium, even though it's not open, but we have to go because the story won't progress if we don't. The game is full of arbitrary checks like this. Once we get rejected by the receptionist and head outside, Team Snaga members block our path. They reveal our shady past to Rui, who doesn't really care that we're a part of a crime syndicate, which is cool. Otherwise, we make short work of them. We're very close to our first shadow and need to buy some Pokeballs. Because this region has no wild Pokemon to catch, allegedly, Pokeballs are rare, but luckily the bartender at the outskirts stand can hook us up. I make sure to buy 10 Pokeballs so that he'll throw in a Premier Ball as a special bonus. On top of everything else, I want all my shadow Pokemon caught in Premier Balls. This would be tough if it wasn't for the infinite Pokeball glitch. All you need to do is use a Pokeball on your first turn, switch it into another slot on your second, and you can reuse the same Pokeball infinitely. After returning to Finnac, this woman alerts us to a gathering of suspicious characters at the mayor's house, so we go and check that out. We meet Mira B, who's a very interesting and ethnically ambiguous person, along with his Power Rangers. He gives us his spiel and we fight these two goons again, but this time one of them has our first shadow Pokemon, Makuhita. Our first shadow has a unique RNG method. We have a battle with Folly, and then we fight Trudley, who has Makuhita. The Makuhita that we get will be locked in as soon as the battle with Trudley starts, and no frames advance in the dialogue beforehand. So essentially Makuhita is generated as soon as we end the first fight. This is an issue because frames constantly advance during battles, and we don't currently have a way to track them. We do have one thing in our favor though. Makuhita is what we call Shadow Locked. In this game, Shadow Locked Pokémon are generated differently compared to most. They're affected by the other Pokémon in the enemy trainer's party, and instead of producing one individual PID for each frame, the game reuses the same PID in alternating clusters. These clusters range anywhere from 50 to about 500 frames long, and it's because of these that we can feasibly RNG Makuhita. See, if we know approximately how many frames it takes to end the battle with Folly, we subtract them and shoot for the middle of the frame window. From there, it's a 50-50 chance we hit our target. To start, I grab my initial seed in Pokefinder and check if there are any square shiny spreads close to me. We need to be around 75,000 frames away from our target before starting the game. Shout out to these guys on Reddit for laying out this method and providing their calibrations. We load in and run straight to the mayor's house. After going through the dialogue, the battle with Folly starts, and we get to the point where one more turn will end the battle. Once there, we go into the Pokemon party menu where frames don't advance. Next. Open up Kotool and plug in your initial seed from earlier into this box. Make sure all your settings are correct for the version of the game you're playing and hit the bottom left button while opening Espeon Summary. If we press Shift every time Espeon blinks, about 10 to 12 times, we can find our current seed. As long as we close the summary screen at the last blink we input, the seed should be pretty accurate. Once we input enough blinks, hit Search and hopefully you'll have a result. Next we plug in our new seed at the top type how many frames left we need to advance, check this box and hit search. We are now ready to use Blink Timer. Blink Timer will help us keep track of the frame advances in Espeon Summary by syncing the blinks with the audible beeps.
It won't be exact when you first open it, and you'll have to decrease or increase the speed until Blink Timer matches Espeon. At this point, simply wait for the timer to run out, close the summary right as it does, and finish the battle as fast as you can. With proper calibration and executing this method correctly, there should be a 50% chance that Makuhita is shiny. And on my second attempt, I managed to land the first shiny of the run. After leaving the mayor's house, all the exits to the city are blocked by the Power Rangers. Each of the three has one of the second Johto starters, and for reasons we'll get into later, we need to fight the Green Ranger who has Bayleaf. While Makuhita may have had a lot of moving parts, our chances of success were still pretty good. However, we are about to enter the Gauntlet of Pain. For the next several Shadow Pokémon, there is no consistent methods for RNG. This is due to what we call noise. Depending on where you are, the game makes RNG calls that affect your surroundings. These include things like random NPC movements, environmental animations, etc. When there is no noise, RNGing is straightforward and no additional frames advance while playing. When there is some noise but not too much, our tools can account for the extra frame advancement. But when there is too much noise, there is no way to predict how many frames the game will advance. There are a few places where the noise level is too high, and one of those places happens to be here in Fenac City. If there is no consistent methods, how will I catch the next several shinies? Well, we have no choice but to use what I call the shoot and pray method. Before we start doing any RNG, we first need to do some calibration runs. We need to know an average of how many frames advance between starting the game and entering the battle. So we check the initial seed, start the game with a timer, and run to the trainer. After catching the Pokémon, we input their stats into a program, I recommend XD Pokémon, and check the number of frames advanced. After doing this several times, you'll start to see a window of possible frame advances. Take the average of your attempts and you now have a calibration. Now let's do an RNG. As usual, we find our seed in Pokefinder and check what spreads are available. Ideally, we want a target spread that is 10,000 frames away plus whatever our calibration is. If it's pretty close, i.e. 60,000 frames or less, we can go in and out of the Battle Now menu and do our advances that way. If it's pretty far, i.e. 70,000 plus, we can enter a battle with a trainer that advances frames much faster. My game consumes about 2000 frames per second, but this will vary per game version and console. You'll need to set a timer to keep track of how long the battle lasts and forfeit when time runs out. Regardless of which method you're using, open up XD Seed and in this tab plug in your initial seed and a reasonable frame range. Then record 4 or so additional Battle Now teams and check what seed you're on. Once you hit the 10,000 plus offset frames away, move over to the next tab. Put in your current seed at the top box, your frame remainder minus your offset in the box below, and hit search. The result gives us our potential paths forward. Each row shows us in order our current seed, the number of advances, the new seed after advances, the remainder advances based on our original target, and the menu inputs needed. We want to pick a path that gets us closest to our target advances with the smallest remainder. The final column tells us whether to choose a single or double battle and the difficulty level. All you need to do is enter these menus in the correct sequence and you'll be ready to start the game. If none of the remainders are low enough and if you have a result that's divisible by 20, you can toggle the rumble feature on or off and saving the setting consumes 20 frames. So sometimes it's better to choose a remainder of 40 versus 2. Anyway, once you've done the right sequence and messed with the rumble if necessary, start the game and the timer at the same time and pray you get lucky. For all the hunts in noisy areas, I usually fell into a frame window of about 250. That's much better than the base odds, but this is also much more involved. All the prep work for each reset took me around 2 to 5 minutes. I recommend continuing to record what frames you hit so you can update your offset and hopefully become more accurate over time, but there will always be variation no matter how consistent you are. Now that you understand the process, let's talk about Bayleaf specifically. There is one thing about it that makes resets much more inconsistent and that's where you spawn in. At this point in the game, my last save was at a Poké Center. There are some moving NPCs in there, but the noise level is fairly low. The problem is, once I exit the building, the noise increases dramatically. So I need to exit the building at a consistent time relative to me starting the game if I want consistent results. But there's a problem. My path to the door is sometimes blocked by an NPC, so I can't take the same path every time. This affects the timing of my exit and will throw things off. 
I dealt with this by setting a two-stage timer, with the first counting down to the building exit, and the second being the start of the battle. After doing this for a while, I tried making the exit even more consistent by lining up my character up with the wall and using the d-pad to go frame by frame until I landed on the same spot. Did this help at all? Probably not, but it made me feel I had more control, so I did it anyway. After 92 attempts, I finally landed Shiny Bayleaf. But our troubles are only just beginning. After defeating the Green Ranger, the path is clear to our next destination, Pyrite Town. Things I like about Pyrite Town. It has an edgy aesthetic and the music is pretty chill. Things I don't like. It is also very noisy and makes RNG a pain. And there are quite a few Pokemon here. You have access to all the trainers in the square, each with their own shadow Pokemon. None of these trainers force you to battle them, so I could save them for later, but I figure I should just get them out of the way so I can at least utilize the extra team members. In no particular order, the Pokemon here are Quagsire, Slugma, Skiploom, Flaffy, Noctowl, and Mischievous. The only upside to hunting here is that there's a straight shot from the spawn point to outside, so I can use a single stage timer, although I don't think that made much of a difference in the end. It's time to grind these out. Quagsire was a pain to catch, breaking out several times and it took a while to weaken. I got my Salamander Boy after 107 attempts. Slugma I had a much easier time with. I did occasionally knock it out accidentally, which was annoying, but after 142 tries, I got my Mucus Amiga. Now Skip Plume gave me some trouble. It wasn't an easy catch, and it would use Sleep Powder quite a bit. The number keeps climbing with 275 attempts for this purple nurple. At this rate, I really needed to catch a break, and Flaffy finally came in clutch. After only 57 attempts, this little sheep blessed me. The Noctowl hunt felt much longer than it was. It was the hardest to catch so far, and the battles would drag on and on with it breaking out over and over again. Despite all the headache, I actually got it in 52 attempts, technically quicker than Flaffy, but much more time spent per battle. The final mon of the square, Mischievous, was equally difficult to catch and oftentimes would crush my team if I wasn't careful. I made sure to do Noctowl prior for the ghost immunity and that honestly increased my survivability a lot for the 5 to 20 turns Mischievous would break out. In all, it took a respectable 71 attempts to grab the green ghost. We're making great progress, but we're not out of the woods yet. At the entrance to the town, we can challenge this man who looks like he's going skiing and also has a shadow for it. 
aside from the longer trek from the stadium, for it is just like the rest in Pyrite. After a record low of 42 attempts, this little guy is mine. Now we need to progress the story a bit more. We go to a scrapyard and find a gear, discover a hidden dungeon full of children, and we take on the Pyrite Stadium. After beating everyone, we're confronted by a member of Cypher on our exit. By winning in the stadium, we've earned a Shadow Pokémon as a prize, but as soon as he and the other Grunt realize who we are, a battle begins with our next target, Yanma. I've seen a lot of talk in the RNG community about how difficult Yanma is in particular, but for our purposes it's really more of the same. The only change in our approach is we need to time the end of the dialogue on the bridge and start of the battle, so another second stage timer. From there, we simply proceed as normal and I managed to find this bug after 196 attempts. Quite a few to be sure, but not even our highest so far. That will change with the next one though. After the grunts run off, we need to scale this building, clearing out several trainers along the way. When we make it up, we swerve over to the top floor and encounter an interesting scene, followed by the battle with Shadow Remoraid. Oh, this Pokémon. This sweet, sweet, terrible fish. When I say this took a while, I mean it really took a while. This hunt took so long that I started in July of 2022 and didn't finish until March of 2023. Compare that to all the other hunts so far, which took a few weeks at most. Why was Remoraid so difficult? Well, it's just another two-stager. The first is on our exit to the Overlook and the second is entering the top floor. But other than that, it's just more of the same. I was just really unlucky, and that's the deal with these inconsistent hunts. There were actually several attempts where I checked how close I was, and I ended up being one frame off. This happened at least five times. It was a very demoralizing period in the run. Now granted, I didn't hunt continuously from July to March, I did take some breaks to work on other projects, but it still took way too long. In total, I got Remoraid, which is a terrible shiny in this game by the way, after 521 attempts. With my slightly purple fish in hand, I made sure to lose the battle intentionally in preparation for the next mod, which finally has a consistent RNG method, praise the lord. And that next one is Mantine. To RNG Mantine, we use a method called Battle Blink. This method is used when you have a battle directly before you battle a shadow. It works by defeating the trainer before your target and inputting the blink pattern of one of the Pokémon during the ending pan. If we don't touch the controller, this pan will continue as long as we need to find our seed, sync the blinks, and advance to our target. The best Pokémon to track blinks that is currently accessible is Bayleaf, which is why we picked it out of the three at Finac. The reason I picked the European version of this game is also because of this method. The primary program used for Battle Blink, Kotool, only works with Japanese and PAL copies, so I couldn't RNG everything on the North American version. We technically could have used this method for Makuhita, but Espeon was our only option for blinks and would have been really hard to see with my video quality. Anyway, let's get into how it works. Before doing anything, make sure to choose the 50Hz option on PAL, as this will be more dependable compared to 60. Like always, we start by finding our initial seed and checking shiny spreads near us. Then start the game and run to the battle before Mantine. After reaching our last turn before the battle ends, open the Pokemon summary screen and use Espeon's blinks to find your current seed. You can use Kotool for this, however since the start of the run, a new program called OpenBlink came out and it is much easier and more convenient to use. It combines the seed finding function with the blink timer in Kotool, allowing you to find the seed and land it more accurately. Once you have your new seed, end the battle with your last attacks and stop when you get to the prize money screen. You have to wait 2-3 to three minutes for the RNG to stabilize, I usually set a timer for 150 seconds. When the timer counts down, open up Code Tool and fill in the proper settings for continuous battle. Our next goal is to find our current seed and sync up Code Tool with the game. We do this by pressing shift every time we see Bayleaf blink. Now, the good thing about Battle Blink is that you don't need to register every single blink in a row. That wouldn't be possible due to the changing angle of the camera. Instead, just register the ones that you can see. 
which is still not easy, but with some added patience, it'll take around 10 to 13 before you nail down a seed. When you get a single result, copy your seed into the top box and switch to the next tab. Paste that seed into the top box, set the frame range for as long as you're willing to wait, select your target Pokemon from the dropdown, check the shiny box, and hit search. The only column we need to focus on is the second one, unless your target has additional advances, which will be shown in the next two columns. This is the number of frames away we are from the target based on the seed we found earlier. Pick a suitable target, copy that number from the second column, and move back to the other tab. Click this button, paste your frames, and hit search. We're now ready to use Blink Timer again. Open it up and start it as soon as you can. Just like we did with Makuhita, we need to sync the blinks with the beeps, pressing faster or slower buttons until we're lined up. Once synced up, all we need to do is wait for the end of the countdown and see what we get. If you don't get your shiny, plug in your stats into a program like XD Pokemon. In this case, I used CoSearch, which we'll need for another RNG soon. Subtract the difference and use that delay for the next attempt. After spending so much time on inconsistent hunts, Mantine was a breath of fresh air. It did take me a little while to get used to the method since it was my first time doing it. Still, I was able to snag the shiny after a handful of tries. We learned that Mirror B stole a plusle just to raise some hell, and we head back downstairs to prepare for our last inconsistent RNG of the game. If we climb back up, this legend will be blocking the entrance to the next area with his Shadow Quillfish. I was definitely worried about this one. During calibration runs, Quillfish was really hard to catch, and it would do annoying things like increase its evasion or poison my team members. Things were really looking bleak though after attempt number 7. This one attempt took 30 minutes, not even counting the setup beforehand. So long that my whole team was wiped and I had to restart the fight. I was very nervous after this. I don't think I could handle hundreds of tries 30 minutes a pop. But then, this happened. On my very next attempt, I caught shiny quillfish, setting a new record low and finally ending the gauntlet of inconsistency. This was a major turning point. I had completed the hardest phase of the challenge, and while the rest would not be easy, at the very least I would have some control moving forward. To celebrate this milestone, I bought a GameCube, using Swiss to run the PAL disc on NTSC hardware. This gave my video quality a much needed improvement, and at the very least it made it easier to see what I'm doing. With the Quillfish Goon defeated, the cave entrance is now open, which will lead us to the Stolen Plusle as well as the next four Shadow Pokémon, starting with Metatite. Metatite is our first RNG that requires co-search. The function of this tool is to track frame advancement from a given seed based on environmental noise. The noise level in this cave is significant, but not so high that it can't be predicted. Here's how it plays out. Grab your initial seed and run to the trainer. Open up the Pokemon Party menu where no frames advance and check Espeon's blinks with Open Blink. After you find your seed, plug it into CoSearch and make sure you have your target Pokemon and area selected from the dropdowns. Check the shiny box and hit search. The first column tells you how many frames it takes to reach the Pokemon with noise factored in, the second is the number of frames without noise, third is your target seed, and fourth is the Pokemon's PID. This is where it gets tricky. For every attempt, we want the number in the first column to be similar, kind of like when we did the TIDSID RNG. Our calibration will change a lot if we start from different frames away. The issue is, we don't have a lot of control of this number because I can't start from any seed. Let me explain. In Espeon's summary, every blink is a brief pause in the frame advancement that allows me to reliably land on a specific seed, but any seeds in between these blinks are inaccessible because there's no reliable way to land on them. The noise pattern also makes it impossible to hit certain spreads from certain seeds. This means we not only need to find a suitable target Pokémon, but a viable seed to start from as well. In practice, this entails finding your target, copying seeds from OpenBlink into CoSearch, and trying to get that first number down as close as you can to your consistent delay. In this example, I'm trying to get my target down to about 900 frames away, and manage to find a seed that's 920, which is likely the closest I'll get without over-advancing. Now that we found a viable seed, we plug that into our target box here, update our starting seed, and sync our blinks with Espeon. Once synced, hit the search button and OpenBlink will count down the remaining time to get to your target seed. After timing the exit correctly, 
Go into the frames to millisecond converter and input your frames away from your target. Copy the result into flow timer and you're ready for an attempt. Make sure to close the party menu and start the timer at the same time. Frames will advance like normal in the regular pause screen. All that's left to do is to start the battle when the timer ends and see what you got. When checking what you hit, uncheck the shiny box in Coast Search and plug in all the stats to see how far off you were to calibrate future attempts. With that, I've gone through every major method of RNG in this game. All hunts moving forward will unfold just like these or use some combination of techniques we've looked at so far. So for my first Coast Search RNG, Metatite was not bad. I was within 1-2 to two frames a lot and sometimes had trouble reaching a consistent starting seed, but with a little patience I got my shiny after 20 tries. Clearing out a couple more trainers who think it's fun to stand in a cave, we make it to the lower floor where a trainer with Shadow Dunsparce blocks our path. The great thing about this level is that there's no noise, but we can't spawn down here and have to trek through a lot of noisy areas. So all we need to do is find our initial seed, run to the trainer, find our current seed, and then use any method of frame advancement we want. If our target is really far away, i.e. hundreds of thousands of frames, or even millions of frames, the fastest way to advance would be viewing Yanma in the snag list. This will advance roughly 17,000 frames every second, so make sure you set a timer and undershoot by a fair margin. If our target is really close, i.e. within a few thousand frames or less, we can use a combination of watching Espeon summary and going in and out of the snag list, which advances 7 frames each time. Remember, the seeds we can use with blinks are limited, so you need to map out ahead of time which ending seed is the closest to your target. Make sure it's divisible by 7, and don't forget to factor in any start of battle delay, which you can find by doing a quick test run. Of course, with the release of Scarlet and Violet, I want my Shiny Dunsparce to be a 3 segment on top of everything else. To find out which is which, I search for Pokemon PIDs that, when converted from hex to decimal, end in 0, zero. For Dunsparce, this means all three segments from this game will have a hardy nature and Serene Grace as their ability. So, I looked for decent spreads that had these and were square shiny, double checked the PIDs, and found one worth going for. All that was left to do was land an initial seed that was close enough to my target spread. Luckily, around this time, I learned how to use Co-Reader, which automatically reads your screen and inputs the trainer name and Pokemon making the initial seed finding much easier. And it's a good thing too, because resetting for seeds can be very time consuming. With Dunsparce, I spent about an hour resetting before I found a seed that was 45 minutes away from my target using Yanma advances. After running to the trainer, staring at Yanma for about 40 minutes, and whittling down my advances bit by bit, I managed to get my square shiny 3 segment Dunsparce first try. Taking a mini break from RNG, I cleared out much of the cave of items and trainers. After that, I located the trainer with the next shadow, Swabaloo. Being back on the top level, the noise has returned and we'll have to do another co-search hunt. Thankfully, my calibrations for Metatite translated well to Swabaloo, and I was able to land it in 10 or so attempts. Clearing out the last of the trainers and items, I prepare for the fight with the big boss, Mirror B. His team is composed entirely of Ludicolos with a Shadow Pseudo Wudo in the back. There is no noise in his chamber, so we can approach the RNG the same way we did with Dunsparce. Except this time I don't need to reset for seed since I'm not super picky about Sudowoodo stats. It helps to intentionally lose the first battle with him so that you cut out the initial animation that plays, just make sure Sudowoodo isn't sent out. Otherwise, its spread will be locked and you can't RNG it moving forward. Within 5 minutes of finding my initial seed, I landed the Jolly Green Pickle. Well, his nature is actually gentle, but you get what I'm saying. With Pickle in hand, Mirror B runs out in disgrace, and we find a kidnapped Plessel. This guy can actually be RNG'd as well, but it can never be shiny, and I don't feel like doing two RNGs in one go, so I didn't bother. This pretty jack dude thanks us for our efforts, and Plessel decides to join our team. We'll actually get a lot of use out of him later on, but for now he's not doing much. Rui has a moment with another psychic before we finally leave Pyrite Town and head towards Agate Village to see Rui's grandparents. We catch them up on events so far when we're quickly informed that the Relic Forest is being invaded by Cypher. 
This is the one place in the game you can purify shadow Pokemon, making it a prime target. After defeating several grunts, some of which were hanging from the ceiling somehow, we make it to the shrine and witness the legendary battler, Egun, E-A Gun, E-A Whatever. We watch Grandpa fight our next target, hit him on top, and lose, leaving us to finish the job. There is no noise at the shrine, but some on the way, so we do a little blink action. I found a shiny spread with decent stats, did my advances, and let the cutscene roll. The Hitmon top is generated when sent out in the Egan fight. Catching it was harder than I expected, but with a few premier balls, Hitmon top is mine. We learn more about the shrine and how to use it for purification, which we're going to hold off on for now, when Muscle Man calls us to Mount Battle, where Cypher is running amok once again. We need to clear out all the trainers from the first 10 levels and are faced with the next Cypher boss, Dakin, and his Shadow Entei. For this stage in the game, he has a strong team. I decided to lose the first battle to skip his cutscene later and head back to Agate Village to gain some levels. Grinding in this game can be a slog with the lengthy battle animations, so I multitask. If you come up to this ledge, unplug your controller and plug it back in while holding up the left stick, the player will continuously walk into the edge, counting the steps. This will give a Pokemon in the daycare consistent experience points and also lowers the shadow meter for those in your party. I threw Espeon and Plusle in the daycare for a couple sessions and after doing more productive things with my life, came back when they each gained a good amount of levels. It was at this point that I decided not to purify any shadow Pokemon until the end of the run. No particular reason why, I guess I thought it would be cool to have all the shadows together at the end. This means I'll mainly use my two starters and Plusle for combat, which sounds tough but as soon as things get challenging I'll just do this for a while. With my levels bumped up, I shot back over to Mount Battle for Entei. Once again there is no noise on the mountain itself, but there is some at the base where you spawn, so we approach it like the last few. I wanted Entei to have good stats, so I searched up a spread and resetted my initial seed until I was close. I ended up finding a seed with a 2 hour Yanma wait, so I went with that one and let it rip. Everything went pretty much exactly how I planned, and after a difficult catch, I got Shiny Entei. Apparently, Dakim just yeets off this platform that's hundreds of feet high. Anyway, one of the employees gives us a time flute which will instantly purify a Pokemon at the shrine, and we take off back to Agate to check in with the grandparents. We then head to Pyrite, where we steal a key from a sleeping convict that gives us access to the Under. Why is it called that? Because it's a city. That's Under. Another city. Ah yes. A very edgy place indeed. As soon as we drop down, Venus, the third Cypher boss, announces to everyone that we're coming and to be on the lookout for us. Except we walk through the whole place with no resistance. And then she makes another announcement saying she's disappointed we haven't been found in a minute later. And everyone just stares at us as we walk past. And after that, there's a bizarre third person cutscene where the remaining Cypher bosses are plotting. Except the player is nowhere near them and has no way of viewing the conversation. And then we just watch one of them walk out for several seconds. Maybe Rui's psychic powers are just rubbing off on me. So eventually we get connected with the kid grid? I don't like the sound of that. <clears throat> I give the main kid an important piece of tech we found before leaving. This little girl asks us for our PDA number. Okay, that's it, we're getting out of here. Outside, we hear that the spy has been captured and this guy seems to take the fall for us. If we talk to one of the guards, they will battle us with a shadow Pokemon. However, we don't need to fight them because this guy in the cage can interact through the barrier and give us the item we need to progress. This is the only skippable shadow Pokemon in the entire story, and it's important that we do skip it because there is no stable method of RNG in the under. We'll run into this Pokemon again in an easier area later on. With the R disc, we hover over to where Venus is filming and go after her shadow Suicune. There's no noise in this room, so the plan is clear. I found a solid defensive spread and reset it a while to get a seed about 90 minutes away with Yanma. Then with a few blinks, I started the battle. Suicune is very tough to catch, especially in a premier ball, and it ended up knocking itself out with its shadow rush recoil before I could snag it. So I had to let Venus's vile plume defeat the rest of my team and I challenged her again. Since the Suicune was sent out during the battle, the spread was preserved, and good thing too because I hit my target first try once again. 
There's this next bit where we chase Venus for a while, eventually reaching this staircase full of trainers with shadow Pokemon. This is the easiest stretch of RNGing in the entire game, because between the PC upstairs and the stairwell, there is no external noise. This gives us a lot of flexibility on how we want to perform each RNG. The first trainer on the stairs has a shadow Gligar, which is one of the few shadow locked Pokemon. One thing I didn't mention about them when going over Makuhita is that though they're clustered together, shiny spreads are much more infrequent and you'll likely have to reset your initial seed a lot to have something close by. I could spend a long time resetting seeds until I'm close to a viable spread and then do all the advances in the main menu, but that could take a really long time. Instead, I opted to find a seed that had targets farther away but still reachable with Yanma advances. With another quick session of that plus some blinks and menus, I easily snagged Gligar. Our next shadow is Stantler. Initially I thought Stantler's stats weren't that important and I could go for any random spread, but then I thought about evolving it into Weirdeer later and I used the exact same method to get a decent spread for it. With several more advances, Stantler did not turn green, which is a relief because that shiny color sucks. It looks a little bit better on Weirdeer, but if this wasn't a full shiny challenge I honestly would prefer the regular colors. Up next, I have Pillow Swine. Not being picky about this one, I selected the closest square shiny, did some advances in the menu, and ran right to it. Now we're cooking with gas. Pillow Swine shines without a problem. The same applies for the next little one, Sneasel. Another quick reset and menu advances lands us this tough gal in no time at all. She did put up a fight before getting caught, so there was at least a little challenge, but still pretty easy. With those four captured, there's nothing left to do but chase Venus further underground. We do a little tango around the train until she drops her key, allowing us to operate the train. The tracks lead us to the cipher base where the two guards are... Oh. Did they just die? Oh no, they just blew a crater in the floor instead of locking the door behind them. It's good they did that because otherwise they wouldn't have dropped a key to the Shadow Lab entrance for us to pick up. It makes you think how much this game's plot revolves around people dropping every important key item and piece of information possible. With that, we have no choice but to return to the surface. With our new key, we unlock the main gate so that we can go in here and unlock this door so that we can go in here and steal this car key from this guy so that we can open this door. Still with me? Okay. Now for our next RNG. We have a choice between three different Pokemon on this floor, of which I start with Apomp. There's no noise here, but the path to get here involves going outside, which is very noisy. Still, we know just what to do, and after some blinks and menus, we're lined up to snag this shiny right off the ceiling. Next, we run into the third Shadow Locked Pokemon in the game, Murkrow. With a wider target and space to breathe, Shiny Murkrow joins the flock. To round out the trio, the last shadow on this floor is Foratress. Just for the heck, I looked for a spread with zero speed, since Foratress can benefit from Trick Room in later games. It took some extra time to find a seed and do advances, but nothing crazy. It's not just a boulder, it's a shiny rock. With all the shadows taken care of in this section, I turned my attention to beating the rest of the goons and grabbing required items. There's an interesting gimmick in this section where you need to collect DNA samples throughout the lab, analyze them to see what Pokemon they're from, and that makes the code to progress. It's nothing crazy, but for a game with a lot of generic themes and gameplay, I thought it was kinda neat. After clearing the first floor, we head down the lift and run into our next RNG, Ariados. Unlike the floor above, this one has noise, so we need to use co-search. There's very little difference here from how we did it in Pyrite, and it seemed like the delays translated pretty well, which got me a shiny on my second attempt. The same can be said for the next target a room over, Granbull. In a clutch session, I was able to land the shiny in just three tries.
We've been absolutely flying through these RNGs so far, but we're finally about to have our momentum broken. Towards the end of this gauntlet, this sore loser turns on the alarm system, and that is not only very annoying to listen to, but it also increases the noise level. This won't make the next shadows any harder per se, we'll just have to start from scratch on the calibration side. If we proceed down the hall and unlock the next door, we'll run into Shadow Vibrava, our second dragonfly of the run. This one went pretty well. I made sure to do quite a few calibration runs before starting, and with about 10 attempts, I got him. The Crimson Wings are sick in this game, by the way. It's amazing how hit or miss some of these shinies can be. With that, we come to our final encounter of the Shadow Lab, and finally finish the Legendary Beast Trio with Raikou. There's been a lot of buzz around this Raikou RNG over the years. It's another co-search hunt, so definitely not guaranteed, and this happens to be the only place you can get a Raikou with good stats in all of Generation 3. The only other way to catch the beasts is in the post-game of Fire Red and Leaf Green, and those are bugged to have zero IVs and four stats. With Entei and Suicune being fairly manageable to RNG, as we saw, Raikou is the tough one of the bunch. I'm only here to get a square shiny, maybe with a good nature and stats, so I don't expect this to be that hard. For those that want to RNG a competitive Raikou though, it's quite a feat and involves spending hours per attempt. Since I don't have any use for a competitive one and I don't even have a square shiny spread that has perfect IVs, I'll just have to go for a quick shiny. Before doing any RNG, we start the battle with Cypher Boss Ein and lose before he sends out his shadow. By doing this, we avoid a cutscene that advances frames each time. Next, we approach it like the last few. I needed to do another set of calibrations for the room Ein is in, and once I was satisfied, I started attempts. Raikou was a serious pain to catch in a Premier Ball. I feel like the average breakout rate per attempt was 30 times, and that's after I knock out most of the difficult team members and weaken it for better catching odds. My number of attempts also got up there compared to the other co search hunts. Maybe Raikou is special, or maybe I got unlucky. Who's to say? The point is, I eventually did hit my target, and it even had a timid nature, which is good for it. The catching process, though, did not go smoothly. Of course, just like Suicune, the time I actually land the shiny, it knocks itself out with recoil. That's why you always go back and check. After a million Premier Balls, I finally caught it. Ein hightails it out of there, and so do we, making our way back to the newly constructed Realgum Tower. Before progressing, we need to rematch all the Cypher bosses in these very interesting little pods. These connectors remind me of those long treadmills at the airport, you know? Not having to worry about their shadow Pokemon, these guys are pushovers. I tackled Dakim and Mirror B before reaching the next couple shadows. After the headache that was Raikou, the game throws us another bone with two noiseless RNGs in one room. I can choose either one and start with some flora. I decided to get a little fancy with this one. After not seeing any shinies close to my first few resets, I decided to do some Yanma advances to speed things up. I took advantage of saving at the PC, which consumes 20 frames each time. That combined with blinks and menus let me use a quick seed and catch my happy Sunflora. Or should I say grumpy Sunflora based on that sprite? The trainer next to her has a Shadow Deli Bird, the pinnacle of competitive Pokemon. This one I just picked a spread, did my advances in the main menu, and grabbed my shiny. Simple as that. I went on to battle the other two Cypher bosses, starting with Ein and then Venus. Once done, I pondered these orbs and summoned the trainer with Shadow Heracross. So this one is Shadow Locked, but it's still in a noiseless room, so very easy to RNG. For whatever reason, I fumbled this guy a few times. It's probably because I was overconfident and started rushing. I missed a blink eggs at once, started the fight at the wrong time, didn't do my advances right. Basically everything that could have gone wrong did, and after taking a deep breath and slowing my pace a bit, I was successful. This door leads us to the lobby of the tower. We fight a trainer posted in front and ride the lift up to the second level. The cool guy is there and says something vague and leaves. We're stopped from following him by my old boss from Team Snagum, Gonzap, with his Shadow Skarmory. 
We once again luck out as there is no noise in this room, so I go for a basic RNG. The problem was that Skarmory refused to get into the ball. There was a very close call where Skarmory almost fainted from recoil before defeating me, which would make it impossible for me to check if it was shiny until the post game, which by then, I wouldn't be able to change anything. But I was lucky and it lived on 1 HP. Well into the second battle, it finally decided to stay in the ball. While I made it through, that Gonzap fight was rough. I seriously needed some levels and more TMs, since at this point my Plusle had no attacking moves. After charging them up in the daycare, I decided to fight my way up Mount Battle to gain some experience and to stock up on battle points, which I can use to buy TM Thunderbolt. It was pretty time consuming, but I managed to fight my way all the way up to Trainer 90, netting me the BP I needed and the level gain I was looking for. With my team ready, it was time for the Real Gum Gauntlet. Upon reaching the top of the tower, the player enters a series of consecutive battles with trainers, each of whom have a shadow Pokemon. Aside from the final battle, any losses will require the player to start completely over. The first trainer has a shadow Miltank. The RNG is pretty straightforward. There's no noise where you spawn in, and a set amount of frame advanced when starting the battle. I did fail my first attempt though in an unexpected way. So, because all the battles are consecutive and the trainers send out their shadows first, I need to lose the battle every time I successfully RNG a shiny. Otherwise, I would get a shiny from the first trainer, battle the second trainer, and lock their Pokémon in as non-shiny. So for my first Miltank attempt, I just so happened to get burned by Porygon's Tri-Attack, and because Espeon has the ability Synchronize, Porygon was also burned, and it died faster than I could finish off my own team. I caught my shiny in everything, but I had to reset to avoid locking the next shadow. Thankfully, this RNG is not difficult, and I was able to repeat my success, this time losing as intended. The next Pokémon in the series is Absol, and this is where the fun begins. Because a battle must take place beforehand, we're going back to the Battle Blink method that we used for Mantine earlier in the run. It should play out exactly like before, except there were some issues getting started. For whatever reason, I could not find my seed when inputting blinks during the battle. I tried 50 and 60 Hz mode, forcing the video to 480i and 480p through Swiss, but nothing worked. Eventually, I switched back to using my Wii, with slightly upgraded video, because that's what I know worked for me last time, and it came through for me this time. With that hiccup ironed out, Absol was no problem. The delay was completely different from Mantine, so I had to find that first before any serious attempts, and after around 8 tries, I caught this beautiful red specimen. The next Pokémon, Houndoom, gave me more trouble. I was having a hard time finding a seed with a close enough target, since sometimes when you go through most of the process and check what shinies are near you, your possible spreads are limited by the advances of the end of battle pan, kind of like how noise in the overworld makes some co-search spreads impossible to reach from certain seeds. Well, I kept going through the process of having no square shinies near my Battle Blink Seed, which amounts to a reset before getting to the battle. With some extra patience though, I did manage to land Houndoom. What follows is pure insanity. So the next shadow in the lineup is Tropius. Definitely a random choice for a shadow, but alright. With the same calibration as the first two, I decided to give it a rip. Happened to have a square shiny close by and I hit my target first try. Then Shadow Metagross followed, and I was dreading this one because it was very difficult to catch. So I give it a rip, found a good spread, and caught the shiny first try again. I was really surprised how fast I blew through these. Granted, Battle Blink is more consistent than something like Co-Search Hunts, but still I feel pretty lucky. The Metagross fight was the only one in the circuit I didn't need to lose right away, due to how things unfold after. Upon beating this guy, surprise surprise, it was the Mayor all along. Rui knew what was going on. The Mayor, or Evice, won't send out his Shadow Pokémon until we knock out some of his other team members. So we go ahead and lose at the start in preparation for his Shadow Tyranitar. 
You'd think the last shadow in the series would be the hardest to RNG, but it's actually one of the easiest. Upon our defeat, any time we go up the tower, we start the fight with Evice right away. We still spawn in an area with no noise, and the battle has a set delay. So as long as we account for that, which I definitely didn't forget to do on my first attempt, Titar is easy peasy. Switching back to the GameCube, I spent some time resetting for a good nature in IVs, and once I found one, I did some Yanma advances, Espeon blinks, and ran back up. Of course, something was bound to go wrong towards the finish line, and in this case, my target once again knocked itself out with recoil. I thankfully made sure Evice had one other Pokemon to knock my team out, and was able to lose the battle again and come back to find that I was right on the money. So Evice keeps hovering there, minding his own business. Then Ho-Oh comes out of nowhere and has a Michael Bay moment, and everybody's like, wow, Ho-Oh, what a baller. Even though this Pokemon has had no involvement or impact on the plot at all, and definitely couldn't have known about the significance of anything transpiring here. Uh, yay, we beat the game. I'm sure you've noticed we still have a few spots to fill in before we're done. Thankfully, the postgame is not very long, and we can grab the rest of our remaining shadows fairly quickly. Most of what you do in the postgame is wander around different areas until someone sends you an email telling you what to do. After a bit of that, we're directed to where we first started the game, Snagum Hideout. It seems to be exactly in the same state we left it, blown up. When we walk in, there's a gap that leads to a staircase, and every time we walk through here, a member of Cypher will fall from the ceiling and battle you until you've cleared out the entire stock. And it so happens that one of these grunts has a shadow Pokemon that we skipped back in the under, Ledian. I know, you all are so surprised I skipped a team staple, a Pokemon that would have breezed through Evice's team like nothing. The reason we want to catch Ledian here is because the noise level is reduced substantially. The noise here is low enough that you can pretty reliably RNG here as long as you set a timer. For example, all I needed to do for Ledian was track my average advances after 8 seconds had passed. That's how long it took to load up the game and start the battle. I then subtracted that from my total and saw what I got. Now this is not super consistent, but it's good enough for a quick shiny. I found this golden beetle after 5 tries. Fighting our way further into the hideout, we find the Red Ranger from the start of the game, who obviously has the Shadow Quilava. We treat it like Ledian, just with more time since it takes a while to run across the whole building. After only a few calibration runs, I got this puppy first try. Once we go to a few more places and read a few more emails, we're told to go back to the Shadow Lab, where we see the Blue Ranger standing in the place of Ayn. He, of course, still has his Shadow Croconaw, the last of the starter trio. This room must be cursed or something, because I had a tough time. There's noise in here even without the alarm going off, so this is another co-search RNG. But it took extra long to find the shiny. I feel like I was consistently 2 or 3 frames off for most attempts after calibration. I had to try 25 times before hitting my target. With that though, there are a few obstacles left to completing the run. After a bit more meandering, it's time to return to the hideout and clear out the new trainers. In the last room, we fight two more shadow Pokemon, starting with Smeargle. I always get confused when I see Smeargle in this game because it seems like the normal and the shiny colors were swapped. We treat this one just like Ledian and Quilava. Do some calibration runs, set a timer, and go for it. It probably took 15 tries in all. Not great, but refreshing after dealing with Croconaw. Directly after, this last trainer has Shadow Ursaring, the last Shadow-locked Pokémon in the game. To be more efficient with this one, I thought using Blinks and a short timer would be consistent enough since I'm aiming for a bigger target. At least doing that would give me a 50% chance every attempt. Despite my thoroughness, I failed the first 5 tries. Part of it was likely due to some user error, but in no time, the ever so slightly discolored bear was mine. If we go back to the other wing of the building, we'll find Gonzap's office where he challenges us to a final rematch. Upon his defeat, we can pick up the D-Disc. When used at the UFO in the Under, this item will send us into the final new area of the game, 
the Deep Coliseum. We then must fight four sets of five trainers, each round ending with a Cypher Boss rematch. With our sizable level advantage, none of these fights were an issue. After blasting through, we unlock a final set that ends with a battle with the Deep King and his Shadow Shuckle. Seems like an odd choice for the final battle. Pretty anticlimactic if you ask me. But whatever, a shadow's a shadow. As you've probably guessed, the first four battles force us to use the Battle Blink method for Shuckle. Time to pull out Old Reliable one last go. The only difference here is that there is no prize money screen at the end of each battle, so we need to make sure no inputs are made after our last turn. This will still allow the camera to pan, and will add frame delay at the end of the battle. Taking those into account, we go through each step, battling the four trainers before each go. My calibration was more inconsistent than I would have liked, probably because of that extra delay, but I decided to run with it. In about six or seven tries, I found this precious little guy. We've come a long way, but there's still one more Shadow Pokemon to snag. Apparently, a rogue trainer that looks like me has been attacking people. After doing some investigating, we're told to watch a news report that shows our doppelganger in action. Side note, I thought Rui was the only one that could see shadow auras, yet this TV seems to pick up on that just fine. Regardless, if we head to their location at the outskirts stand, we face our mirror image with the very last shadow, Togetic. The desert has some noise, so the final RNG will use co-search. With a little calibration and a few goes, the Golden Fairy is here to close out our journey. It took over a year of resetting, of button mashing, of counting, of beeping, of learning the ins and outs of Pokemon Coliseum. But I finally did it. It's hard to describe. I have both an appreciation for this game and an intense hatred for it at the same time. The beginning portion was so hard and took so much longer to complete, it doesn't even feel like the same game. Being able to actually use RNG in a consistent way makes all the difference. After taking one last look at our collection of shadows, the only thing left to do is purify. Otherwise, they'll be trapped in this game with not a lot to do since the story is finished. To avoid doing extra work, I let my character go for a 17 hour walk, and in no time, my shiny shadows are ready to receive their ribbons. So that's it. I've caught all the square shiny shadows in Premier Balls. I never have to play this game again. Well, that's only partially true. Sure, I've caught every shadow Pokemon in this version of the game, but there are three more exclusive to the Japanese version. So I suppose I need to include them as well if I really want all the shadow shinies. But we'll save that for another time. For now, I want to say thank you for sticking around. There was a lot of technical jargon in this video, and I probably didn't need to go into that much detail, but this is something that, for whatever reason, I'm very passionate about and wanted to do justice. If you can sit through all of that, you have my respect. I can think of no better way to end this whole thing than with one final showcase of all that we've accomplished. Thanks again, and enjoy.